The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. At this exact moment, your home is one of many millions in which this radio program is tuned in. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society, we feel that this nationwide home listening carries with it a very serious responsibility. Our Equitable Radio message must be keyed to home and family problems. Tonight's Equitable Society message is on education. If there are children in your home, you'll be particularly interested in this commercial about the Equitable Education Fund. Don't miss it in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Friendly Frame-Up. It is a truism in law enforcement circles that no criminal is easy to catch. Each one presents a new problem, demanding a new approach. Some, of course, are easier to apprehend than others. It is simpler to bring to justice the criminal who lives by crime alone, who earns no honest dollar than it is to trap the species of lawbreakers among us, who live a Jekyll and Hyde existence who operate a legitimate business as a front and a criminal business undercover. Those people are difficult to weed out because for the most part they take no active role in the commission of any crime. Mainly they are the brains and the money behind the operation of a complex criminal machine. A machine which is built to stop at nothing. The night's file opens in a smoke-filled gymnasium. Sweaty fighters are going through their training workouts. One shadow boxing, one working with a sparring partner in the ring, another punching the heavy bag. It's 11 o'clock in the morning as Pete Webb, who manages these fighters, walks through the gym to his office. Work, Lefty. Keep going. Okay. Nice footwork, Jackie. See me later, will you? Right. Hey, Mr. Webb. Uh, Hi, Buffalo. Me... No time for you now, kid. Catch me in an hour, huh? Okay. Louie. Right with you. Louie! Call back later, will you? Yeah. Uh-huh. Goodbye. Good morning, boss. Who was that? Bob Hudson. What do you want? The job. Are you kidding? Bob thinks just because I managed him, he was, when he was fighting, I should support him for the rest of his life. Let him drop dead. What's coming this morning? Little Danny's in the jug. Where'd you get that? Yancey was in. He just visited Danny, got the whole story. What happened? Well, Danny said he met a guy on a train coming east. What kind of a guy? A bond salesman. Danny got him loaded, and the guy spilled that he was carrying some bonds. Uh Uh-huh. Well, it's perfect for Danny. He's always got those go-to-sleep pills in his kick, so he slipped some in the guy's drink and clipped his briefcase. Well, what went wrong? Well, the guy must have come too awful fast. He quit contact with the cops. They call it Danny in the station? No. Uh, not till he hit his apartment. What about the bonds? Well, Danny was afraid he might have a tail on him, so as soon as he hit the railroad station, he checked the briefcase at the baggage counter. Uh uh-huh. Then he put the claim check in an envelope and dropped it in the mailbox. Who'd he mail it to? Well, that's what Yancey came up to tell us. Danny mailed the claim check to you. No. Did it come in? No, Danny free. We should get it this afternoon. Then he wants for you to get rid of the bonds and get some cash to him for a mouthpiece. I see. Uh... Where'd he check this time? North Side Station. Well, when the baggage checks him, then you run over there and pick the stuff up. Me? Yeah. Are you kidding? No, why? There's liable to be 50 cops waiting around that baggage counter. You just told me that he wasn't picked up till he hit his apartment. All right, he could have talked since then. Mm, Daddy wouldn't talk. Then why don't you pick the stuff up? Well, uh... For the same reason I got, huh? Look, we just can't leave the stuff there. It's too good a score for us. We gotta get some... 
Wait a minute. What? I got an idea. <laughs> Ellie. Yes, Bob. Where are you, honey? I'm in the bedroom. Okay. You're home early, honey. Any luck today? Yeah, I got a job. Oh, Bob, that's wonderful. Oh, I'm so excited. Wait I... a minute, honey. Don't get too excited. Why not? Well, wait till you hear who I'm working for. Who? Pete Webb. Oh, no, Bob. Well, Ellie, I had to find a job. Yeah, but not with Pete. Bob, how could you after the things that he's done to you? I know what he's done to me, but... We also have to eat. But, Bob, there are plenty Honey, of listen. guys that... For two solid months now, I've been pounding the pavement looking for work. I know, but... I found out real quick about my friends. They turned out to be a lot of guys who only wanted to be around while I was winning. But other people... Other people? Well, I take one look at this nose and these cauliflower ears and practically come right out and tell me they're not interested in hiring a punch-drunk fighter. That's why I finally called Pete. I understand, Honey. I'm sorry. It's okay. What are you going to do for Pete? I don't know, but I told him no larceny. What did he say? He said the job was clean. When did he start work? This afternoon. I got to pick up something for him. What? A package that's checked at Northside Station. The same afternoon in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching his desk. Jim. Oh, Jim. Oh, yes, Paul. I've been looking for you. Huh? I just left the boss. He's put us both on a case that just came in. Oh? What are the details of it? A man named Lawrence Black was on a train en route here from Cleveland. He was robbed of $21,000 of negotiable bonds. Oh, how was the job done? The thief slipped some knockout drops into one of Black's drinks. I see. When he came to, he gave the police at the station a good description of the man he was drinking with. Uh-huh. The description was so good, in fact, that the local police picked up the thief within an hour as he was entering his apartment. Oh, wait, Paul. If they picked him up, what's the case? What are we working on? The thief didn't have the bonds on him. Oh, I see. I presume the police searched his apartment. From top to bottom. But there wasn't a trace of either the bonds or the briefcase they were in. Well, are the police sure they've got the right man? The victim made a positive identification. Mm, I see. Jim, our job is to find out what he did with those bonds between the time he got off the train and the time he got home. Okay. Who's the thief, Paul? His name is Newton. He has a long criminal record. Newton, huh? Hey, what's his first name? Dan. Dan Newton? That's right. Hey, that could be little Danny. Paul, have you got anything on him here? A description, maybe? Got a whole file right here. Pictures and all. Oh, swell. You have a look at it, huh? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that's little Danny, all right. You know him, Jim? Yes. Yes, and I think I know where the bonds are. Really? Yes, you see, little Danny has always used a regular pattern of operation. He rides trains, picks up a victim, clips him, then checks his loot at the railroad station as soon as he gets off. But, Jim, there was no baggage check found on him when he was picked up. No, no, there wouldn't be. His usual procedure is to mail the check either to himself or to a friend. Paul, what station do you arrive in? The north side station. Let's notify the police and have them send a man to that baggage counter at once. <laughs> Hey, bud, how about that bag? I gave you the check five minutes ago. Look, can I get some service here? Oh, brother. Hey, hey, you, is that the briefcase? Yeah. Well, it's about time. Let me have it. Here. Wait a minute. Hmm? You better let me have that briefcase. Who are you? Police. Here's the badge. What is this? Just give me the briefcase, Hudson. How do you know me? I used to watch you fight. Now, let's have the bag and come along with me. What for? This is an arrest. Hmm? I gotta take you in. Look, I don't get any of this. You just claimed that briefcase. Well, so what? I'm picking it up for the guy I work for. Hudson, that briefcase was stolen. Hmm? There's $21,000 worth of negotiable bonds in there. Well, wait, there must be some mistake. There's no mistake. I know the briefcase, and I've been waiting an hour to nail whoever picked it up. Whoever picked it up? Yeah, now come on. Wait a minute, I'm being framed. Come on, I said. Oh, no, let go of me. Hey, come back here. Stop or I'll shoot. Hudson, you hear me? Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Jim. I'm down at the railroad station. 
investigation. We've gotten a bad break. Oh, what's that, Paul? A man picked up the briefcase about ten minutes ago. An officer attempted to arrest him, but he got away. With the briefcase? Yes. Oh, that is tough. The police feel they can pick him up pretty quickly, though. How's that? The arresting officer recognized the man. Said his name was Bob Hudson, ex-prize fighter. Yeah, I've heard of him. Hudson was wounded in the getaway. The officer fired two shots at him. He certainly hit him at least once. Any idea where this Hudson lives? The police are checking that now. Paul, have them call me as soon as they find his address. Yeah, honey. Bob. Bob, what's wrong? Just let me sit down a minute. Look at your shirt. It's blood. Yeah. Darling, what's happened? A bullet grazed my shoulder. Oh, I'll call a doctor. Wait, no doctors, Ellie. Huh? The guy with a gun was a cop. Oh. I was framed, Ellie. Pete Webb framed me. Oh, no, darling, how? What well, bag I was to call for at the railroad station it was loaded with stolen bonds. $21,000 worth. Yeah. And he sent you there knowing that? Sure, hoping I'd get away clear. Oh, this is awful. Oh, you were right about Pete, honey. I shouldn't have taken that job. Oh, forget about that. Why did the cop shoot you? Well, it was going to take me in. I couldn't let Pete's frame go that far, so I busted away from him. Bob, you shouldn't have done that. Pete was in the wrong, not you. Well, I can never prove that from the city jail. Bob, you just got to let me call the doctor. I said no, Ellie. But I can't Look, just... I wouldn't be here anyway when he came. What do you mean? I got a call to make. What? I'm going to go see Pete Webb. I'm going right now. Bob, please listen to me. Your shoulder... The bleeding stopped. But you've, you've got to let Ellie, me do... Ellie, I'm going to go see Pete Webb, and I'm going to make him come down to the cops with me and tell the real story about those stolen bonds. Uh, just a minute. Hello, Louie. Hiya, Bob. Come on in. Pete, it's Bob Hudson. Oh, hiya, kid. Hello, Pete. What took you so long? I was beginning to get a little worried about you. No kidding. Hey, what's with the blood? In my shirt? Yeah. What happened? I got shot. Huh? By who? Cop. What for? You should know what for, Pete. I don't get you. The briefcase. The briefcase that you framed me into picking up. Oh, I sent you on an errand, that's all. Well, stop the routines. Hey, where is the briefcase? I haven't got it. The cops get it? No. And where is it? I put it away in a safe place. It's going to stay there until I take both you guys and the bonds to the cops. You're going to take us to the cops? That's right. <laughs> Pete, this guy really is punchy. You did frame me. you got to admit that. Yeah. I admit it. But only to you, not the cops. I was just paying you back for an old score. What do you mean? The time you double-crossed me in Bay City. I never double-crossed anybody in my life. Remember the time I had you in a main at Bay City? I bet against you. I told you about it. You turn around and win the fight. I've tried to win every fight. You're in one now, you ain't gonna win. Oh, no. I'm taking you both to the cops right now. Hold the phone. Hmm? This gun says different. That ain't stopping me, Louie. That's what you think. No guns, Louie. This is better. Louie, uh, yeah. take this blackjack. When he comes to, keep using it on him till you find out where he stashed that briefcase. Well, okay, boss. Where are you going? I want some action. I'm going to the fights. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Tomorrow on hundreds of football fields, boys and girls will raise their voices in the old traditional songs. The same songs you and I sang in our college days. Well, college wasn't all singing for me, Mr. Keating. I had a swell time, but I took medicine and studied pretty hard at it. Of course you studied, Harry. And there are hundreds of thousands of others just like you. That's why the average college graduate earns $72,000 more during his working years than the average American. What's more, that extra $72,000 is just half the story. Educated men and women have cultural interests and appreciation that they wouldn't part with for any amount of money. 
So, for many reasons, everyone agrees college is the wisest and best investment loving fathers and mothers can make for their children. Well, I certainly hope that my boy will get the chance to go. If I were you, I wouldn't leave it a chance. Why not make sure he'll go? Make sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? Never heard of it before. It's a surefire plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society, and it includes these important features. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Two, when your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Three, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. Well, sounds okay to me, Mr. Keating. Where do I get one of those equitable education funds? The man to see is your equitable society representative. Give your children their chance to earn that extra $72,000 by getting in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Friendly Frame-Up. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates one major point. A point which cannot be stressed too strongly or repeated too often. It is absolutely impossible for a decent law-abiding citizen to do business with a criminal. The two cannot mix any more successfully than oil and water. Because their minds and their hearts are so different. The decent man lives by the credo that he must work for what he gets. And that his fellow man is entitled to the same courtesy and dignity that he himself expects in return. But the criminal regards his fellow men as just so many potential victims. And he looks with contempt on those who work for what they want. Your FBI asks you to remember those things if you're ever tempted to enter into any agreement with a criminal. Remember them and heed them well. Tonight's file continues that same evening at the local FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned to his office where Special Agent Meriden is waiting for him. Hello, Paul. Any word from the police on Hudson? Not since I've been here, Jim. Had any dinner yet? No, the drugstore's going to send up a sandwich and some coffee. That'll hold me for a while. The note you left for me said you went to Hudson's house. What happened? Oh, his wife was there. When I questioned her, she told me that Hudson had been given a job just this afternoon by his old manager, Pete Webb. Pete Webb? Yes. Webb's a local character who's on the shady side, but nobody's ever been able to get anything on him. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Hudson says that Webb sent her husband for the briefcase. Did he know what was in it? Well, she said no. She said that Hudson returned to the house wounded this afternoon after he'd been at the station and that he'd gone from there to Webb's apartment. What for? To make Webb go to the police with him and admit that the whole thing was a frame. I see. So I left Hudson's and went over to Webb's apartment. Yes? Webb had gone out to the fights, according to a stooge of his named Louis Slater, who answered the door. Louis Slater? Hmm. Where do I know that name from? Oh, he's a petty larceny hoodlum. He said he'd heard of Hudson, but that he didn't know him, and that Hudson had positively never been to Webb's apartment. I don't trust people who are so positive. Neither do I, Paul, but I didn't have a search warrant, so there wasn't much I could do except take his word for it. I'll, I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Taylor. This is Spencer down at headquarters. Oh, hello, Spencer. We've got Hudson again. Hmm? And this time he won't break loose. Where'd you find him? He was unconscious in an alley off Main Street and First Avenue. He's over at City Hospital now. Still unconscious? According to last reports, he was. In fact, the doctors say they don't know if he'll ever come out of it. Oh. Well, thanks very much, Spencer. Right. Bye. Hudson is at City Hospital. Unconscious, Paul. Come on, let's get up there. <laughs> Thought you were going to wait for me at the apartment. Yeah, I was, but something important came up. I came to tell you... Don't tell me nothing this round's over. Come on, sailor. Come on, boy. Get in there now. Keep the left out there. Yeah. 
Now, what have you got? A guy from the FBI was around. He was looking for Hudson. What'd you tell him? I said I didn't even know the guy. Good. What'd you do with Hudson? I dumped him in an alley. Alive? Yeah, just about. That's bad. Look, you didn't say nothing about knocking him off. Okay, okay. Did you find out where you put the stuff? Yeah, I think so. What do you mean, fake? Well, he never came to after you conked him. So I frisked him and I found this key. What is it? Well, it fits one of those subway locker boxes. It says so right here. Yeah. I figured it's probably a box on that station near where Hudson lives. Yeah, the key's got a number on it. Well, we can check. That's a good idea. Uh, look, Louie, why don't you go up and see if you're right? Are you kidding? No. Look, that's how Hudson got where he is. Look, Louie, I want to watch this fight. I'll see you at the gym in the morning. Report to emergency. Hi, Jim. Oh. How is he? Oh, he's still unconscious. They patched up the bullet wounds, but somewhere Hudson took an awful beating. After he was shot? Must have been. You think he got the beating at Webb's place? Mm -hmm. Could be. I checked on what time Webb got to the fights tonight. He'd have had time to see Hudson and still get to the arena when he did. Hudson didn't have the bonds on him when they found him, did he? Uh -huh. no, his pockets were empty, Paul. What did the doctor think of Hudson's chances? Oh, 50-50. He might pull out of it, but there's no telling. Uh oh Comes his wife now. Hello, Mr. Taylor. Mrs. Hudson. The nurse told me you spoke to the doctor. Yes, that's right. How is he? Is he going to get better? Well, Mrs. Hudson, it'll be a little while, probably, before the doctors know any more than they do now. Here comes one of them now, Jim. Oh, oh yes, that's him. That's Bob's doctor? Yes. He's coming over here. Well, now, be calm, Mrs. Hudson. It'll... Bad news. I, I know it. I can see it in the doctor's face. <laughs> hey, Tiger, did Pete come in his office yet? Yeah, he's in. Thanks. That's you, Louie? Uh-huh. Pete, I got some news for you. What is it? Well, you were worried about me not knocking off Hudson, huh? Uh-huh. He died this morning in the hospital. How do you know? I heard the rumor from a dozen guys, so I called the hospital. I see. They said it was official, and he also told me he died without ever coming to. That means he couldn't tell the cops where he stashed the bonds. Oh, that's right. Uh, where's that locker key? Right here in my kick. Where do you think we should start looking? Like I said last night, we go first to the subway station near where Hudson lived. Okay, let's go. <laughs> The locker should be down at this end of the platform. Uh-huh. Wait a minute. What is it? It's a train coming. Oh. It's an express, Pete. It ain't, it ain't stopping. Uh -huh. Well, come on. Louis, that looks like the locker's down there. Yeah. Now let's just hope they got number 2177. We'll just walk by the lockers and take a gander at the numbers as we pass. Okay. Hmm. Do you see what I see? Good old number 2177. Uh -huh. Let's go to work. Here's the key. Okay. Fits, huh? Yeah. yeah. There we are. What's in there? Just what we're looking for. A briefcase. Oh, swell. Let's open it up, huh? Not here, stupid. Come on, let's get going. Wait. What is it? That guy coming toward us. He's the guy from the FBI. You sure? Yeah. Let's round and make for the other exit. Quick! There you are, both of you! Not a chance! Oh! Oh, they're coming your way! I see them! Wait, Pete, we're blocked off! All right, you two, don't move. Nice going, Paul. All right, Webb. Let's have that briefcase. What is this? I don't think I have to explain. 
Well, Paul, let's call the hospital as soon as we can. Hudson will be happy to know we picked these men up. Hudson's dead. You just heard a rumor that he was dead. I planted that rumor with a fight mob. I hoped it would get back to you. But the hospital said he was dead. They were instructed to say that. Hudson's not only alive, but he told us where the bonds were. He also told us that you probably had the missing key. This is nothing but lies. I think you'll change your mind when Hudson's testimony sends you both away for a long, long time. Pete Webb and his henchman, Louis Slater, were tried in a federal court and given 20 years for violating the National Stolen Property Act. They were then turned over to local authorities and sentenced to an additional long term for attempted murder. And thus, your FBI performed a double function in tonight's case. First, they apprehended the guilty criminals. And second, they proved the innocence of an accused man. It's the everyday job of special agents to arrest the violators of certain federal laws. And the story of their success in that job is in their record and in their reputation. But the second function performed in tonight's case is even more important. Because the basic foundation of good law enforcement must be public confidence. The knowledge that the public has that it will not be victimized in order to build up an impressive record of convictions. That each individual questioned will be treated as innocent until he is proven guilty. That is why every special agent is instructed when he is appointed a member of the Federal Bureau of Investigation that the primary job of your FBI is to protect the American people and that a major part of that protection is seeing to it that no innocent man be found guilty of a crime he did not commit. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now one last word about the Equitable Education Fund. The outstanding feature of this plan is this. It makes sure that your children will be educated no matter what happens. Whether you live or die, they'll get the education you want them to have. So don't wait any longer. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that graphically illustrates the fate of a supposedly honest businessman who chooses to consort with thieves. Its subject, fraudulent bankruptcy. Its title, Merchants of Arson. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society broadcast are adopted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Merchants of Arson, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.